We're happy to have you here today in this call for an expertise session about Oracle audits. And the question is, are you ready? Now, to start the presentation, let me give you a short introduction first about who I am and what I'm doing right now. Uh, my name is Richard Spitova. As I said before, I'm based in the Netherlands. And in the period of 2005 to 2009, I was a licensing consultant within Oracle performing audits on behalf of Oracle on the larger and the medium-sized accounts within Belgium, Netherlands, and Luxembourg. And after that period of time, uh, I took over the position of regional director for Oracle's compliance department called LMS, which stands for License Management Services for the region Europe South, which means that all the compliance activities from Oracle that took place in Belgium, Netherlands, Luxembourg, France, Spain, Italy, and Portugal were under my um, responsibility. And approximately a year and a half ago, uh, I've decided to leave uh, Oracle after those many years of uh, service in the LMS organization to become a managing partner of the uh, company called Belay, which is uh, created uh, to support end users in managing their software licenses in a proper way. And the today's session, what I would want to share with you is the experiences that I've learned within Oracle about Oracle audits. Uh, what do you need to think about? What do you should be uh, considering when you're confronted with an audit from Oracle? Uh, because I always say, and that's a bit my slogan, if you understand the facts, then it enables you to make the informed business decisions that you as an end user organization should be aware of uh, going forward in managing software licenses in general and as to be discussed today, particularly for Oracle. So that's enough about me. Um, if I'm moving to the agenda, to the next slide, where I'm going to talk about today is about the common misunderstandings and issues that we typically see where customers are confronted with an Oracle audit, uh, but also what is an Oracle audit actually all about? Uh, how does it start? What are the different steps that are being followed during an audit? How does an audit typically closes? Uh, but also, where should you be thinking, should you be consider if you are under audit from Oracle, or what tips and tricks should you keep in mind in order to uh, make sure that you are being uh, going through an Oracle audit in the best possible way. And to conclude, I will have some uh, 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 reminders or takeaways for you in terms of what is the best solution to tackle an Oracle audit. Um, and feel free to ask any questions during this session if and when you feel applicable. Uh, I definitely would like to keep it interactive. So um, any questions that you have or may have, feel free to shoot them during the session. Now, if we're moving to the next slide, and we're going to talk about, OK, what are the common misunderstandings and issues that we see um, at customers that are being audited by Oracle? actually bring them back to five different topics. And uh, I think one of the most important things to be aware of is that if you are being audited by Oracle, you are required to cooperate with an audit from Oracle. A lot of people think oh, the, the first defense strategy that they have is we shouldn't cooperate, we shouldn't be um, uh, doing anything. But as we will see at a later stage, if you are having Oracle software, you are required contractually to cooperate with an audit. The other thing is, is that um, in many, many different uh, countries, um, uh, an audit is not being called an Oracle license audit, but it's being called an Oracle license review. Or in certain countries, like specifically the UK, but also in Western Central Europe, people are being confronted with a compliance optimization license sales business review, which sounds very friendly and is typically initiated by the Oracle sales organization. But what people should be aware of is that every engagement, which is called business review or license review or um, evaluation of your licenses or an evaluation of your deployment and usage and compare those two, are actually all coming down to the same thing. You're being audited by Oracle with the objective to understand if there are any compliance issues and to understand if there are any cross and upsell opportunities possible within you as an end user organization. People are typically not aware of that because uh, they get a letter which talks about a license review. Uh, but you need to be aware of the fact that that is absolutely the same as an audit. The reason why Oracle calls it a license review 
is because of the fact that they want to emphasize that it's a joint exercise in which Oracle requires your input in order to get a clear picture of your entitlements and deployment of the software. The third common misunderstanding is that um, what we see a lot in end users is that typically end users are very reactive in terms of managing their Oracle licenses and they become proactive at a too late moment. Um, it is not uncommon that Oracle customers typically start thinking about, oh, what is actually my contractual position in terms of what I'm entitled to make use of? Or, oh, what am I actually really using from Oracle software? Only at the moment that an audit is initiated. While, if you think about it, software assets, and specifically software assets from Oracle, but also other major software vendors, typically are 60 to 70% of the total IT assets that a company should manage. But you see that there is little to uh, no control typically and that people only start thinking about really looking into those software licenses the moment there is an audit announced, which is typically too late. The fourth thing is, is that uh, if you talk about Oracle, there are many, many tool vendors uh, nowadays in the market like iQuate, Flexera, uh, HP Universal Discovery, Nova Ratio, EasyTrust, and many, many more that can be reviewed on the Oracle LMS website, where a lot of people think, oh, if I buy such a tool, which is verified by Oracle, we must have full control. Reality is, however, different because those tools only help you in gathering data for database products like database, database options, and database management packs, but still doesn't tell you anything about your license compliance position, let alone if you're talking about other Oracle programs like Siebel, eBusiness Suite, GD Edwards, where typically none of those tools can really provide you the data that you would need to have in order to understand what your real usage and therefore license requirements are. So the last thing summarizes actually everything. Um, a lot of people are not aware of the fact that it's all in the details. Customers do not have clarity on the real entitlements that they are entitled to make use of and do not have clarity on what they're really using or deploying from Oracle software programs and therefore typically end up into situations which are financially typically uh, very uh, affecting the company. Now, we will go in all those five steps, we will go in much more detail during the session uh, so that I can explain to you where that is coming from. Now, if you're looking at an Oracle audit and you want to see, okay, where does it actually start or what is it, then you typically all have signed an agreement which is called an Oracle License and Service Agreement or an Oracle Master Agreement, or even if you have old agreements which is called a so, uh, uh, software License and Services Agreement, an SLSA, and within that large pile of paper and a lot of uh, contractual clauses, there is typically in that agreement, in clause O, just four or five lines which says what the audit is all about. Now, if we have a closer look on that audit clause, then it says, typically as a standard, because there are sometimes exceptions, but typically the standard is applied, the order clause says, upon 45 days written notice, Oracle may audit your use of the programs. Now, what does that actually mean? It actually means that the moment that Oracle would want to start an audit at your organization, they need to send you a letter, it needs to be a written notice, and they can only start within 45 days. Reality, however, is, is that, of course, Oracle typically tries to start earlier. So typically you see that within one or two weeks, Oracle tries to engage already with the customer because they have a suspicion that there is a non-compliance issue. Contractually, however, you only are required to allow Oracle's order auditors to work with you once the 45 days have expired after, the the after you have received the letter. Now, the second part, you agree to cooperate with Oracle's audit and provide reasonable assistance and access to information, tells you that, like I said in the beginning, contractually, you all, as an Oracle end user, have agreed on the fact that you need to cooperate with Oracle's audit. So you can't just deny it, or you can't just stall it. But you need to provide reasonable assistance and access to information. And what that is, is, of course, not defined. So customers that for example, are in a very busy period of the year, for example, a retailer at the end of 
the year in December is typically very busy, you can ask yourself it is, if it is reasonable if Oracle at that moment in time would want to perform an audit because it's not reasonable to do that at that stage of the year. Now, the third part is that it says in the audit clause, you agree to pay within 30 days of written notification any fees applicable to your use of the programs which are in excess of your license rights. Now, what does that mean? What do you need to be aware of? Once you are going through an audit, at the end, you will get a final report. And how that looks like and what it entails, we will talk about later. But the moment that you receive that report as a final report, it means that in 30 days, which is typically a very short period of time, you are required to pay what you have been found to be non-compliant. Therefore, the date on which the final report from the Oracle audit is being sent to the end user is a very important day to keep in mind because you will be for sure that Oracle will put you on this, will, will remind you on this uh, sentence in the audit clause and will require you to pay within 30 days. So that's a pushing thing where Oracle will push for if you really have big financial exposure with regards to the Oracle software. And what happens then if you do not do that? Well, if you do not pay, as in the fourth sentence of the audit clause, Oracle can end your technical support licenses and or disagreement. So worst case, what can happen is that Oracle, if you are not paying for the licenses and the support that you've been using, that Oracle completely ends the contractual agreements between you and an end user. Now, does that happen very often? No, because of course, Oracle would not want to lose you as a customer. But you need to be aware that if you are not following the processes and the payments that you've agreed upon in your contract, Oracle, as a uh, uh, last attempt, can go so far that they completely end the agreement, making sure that you need to deinstall all the software that you have which typically for an end user that is using Oracle software in business critical uh, environments is not an option because of the fact that then the whole uh, operations would be completely stopped. Therefore, be aware of the fact that this is the ultimate thing that Oracle can do. And last but not least is that the uh, audit clause says is that you agree to Oracle, you agree that Oracle shall not be responsible for any of your costs that you need to make during the course of the audit. Now, Oracle will pay for the costs that they make, the costs, the salaries of the auditors, uh, uh, the travel approvals that they need to have or the travels that they need to uh, fulfill in there. But be aware of the fact that for an average customer that may have not looked into their software licenses, the cost during an audit can vary between 200,000 and a million in terms of resources, in terms of outsources that they need to pay to garner certain information. And therefore, it can be a very costly exercise uh, if you haven't been doing anything with regards to your software license management the moment that you are entered by Oracle in an audit because you agreed to pay for the costs yourself. Now, we've just looked at the audit clause uh, in the agreement and what the contractual requirements are that you need to comply with if Oracle starts an audit. The audits that Oracle performs are typically being done by a department within Oracle called LMS, which stands for License Management Services. That department is part of Oracle's finance organization and is chartered to perform those audits on Oracle's behalf. Now, you can be selected for an audit actually in two different ways. And that can be, on one hand, the LMS organization itself, or on the other hand, the Oracle sales organization. So how does that work? Well, I, I would say, 50 to 60% of the customers that are selected by uh, Oracle to be performed an audit on uh, is coming from sales. Because for example, sales representatives are talking to a customer and hear that they are going to deploy the Oracle software in a new VMware cluster, or they're going to deploy the software on a new data center for disaster recovery purposes, or the DBA has been talking to people from Oracle and said, well, you know what? Those diagnostic pack and tuning pack are really powerful management uh, packs, so we really started to use them on all our major systems. Now, that specific information that the Oracle sales organization or partners from Oracle gather from your employees within the end user organization can result in the fact that there is a risk of non-compliance. Because if that sales guy hears that, for example, the DBA or wants to deploy management packs, but the sales guy also doesn't know that there is no management pack licenses available. 
he knows for sure that there is a license compliance issue and therefore it should be audited by LMS to quantify how much the financial exposure is. So be aware of the fact what information you share with what people and how that is in line with what you are currently contracted for because it can trigger audits from Oracle's side. Now let's say the, the remaining 40-50% of the customers that are selected for an audit is done by LMS and how are they doing that then? Well, the LMS organization performs on a, let's say, regular but typically six months, three months to six months basis. They perform a risk analysis over all the end users that Oracle has. So Oracle, of course, has a huge uh, 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 installed base of customers and there have been defined a large amount of uh, risk criteria on which those customers are qualified. So, for example, if a customer has historical metrics like universal power units, named users, concurrent device licenses, all those licenses have been sold many, many years ago. But due to the fact that IT have evolved, those metrics are typically not applicable anymore for your current deployment or are hard to manage and therefore indicate a risk of non-compliance. The other thing, for example, is the last purchase date on which you purchase certain database or middleware licenses. Um, for those people that know Oracle licensing a bit, database and middleware products are typically licensed on a processor-based licensing model, either processor or name user plus, where the hardware and the specifications of the hardware on which the software is deployed determine for a large extent what the amount of licenses are that are required. Now, Oracle also knows that a lot of end users typically renew their hardware every three to four years. So if the last purchase date of database of middleware licenses has been three to four years ago, that increases the risk of non-compliance if nothing has changed in your license portfolio. And the last example, but there are many, many other examples that you can think of, but think, for example, about uh, organizations that are merging or divesting or acquiring other entities. The moment that your organization is changing because of, that, because of the fact that you, for example, acquire another company and therefore the number of employees in your organization is increasing, that can result in the fact that you would need to have additional licenses and therefore results in the fact that the risk of non-compliance from an Oracle perspective is higher and therefore initiates earlier an audit to be performed at such an organization. Now we're moving to the next slide and we're going about okay how does it then start once you've been selected for an audit. Now it starts typically with a so-called notification letter uh, which is being sent to the chief information officer or the chief financial officer of your organization which tells you dear customer based upon the right that we have in our contracts, you've been selected for an Oracle license review. And the Oracle license review has the objective to validate your entitlements and deployments to understand what your current license compliance position is. The reason why it is sent to the CIO or the CFO is because of the fact that Oracle wants to make sure that higher level management within the organization is aware of the fact that Oracle starts this audit so that they at all times will have the opportunity to go back to the CIO or the CFO to escalate if certain things are not happening during the course of the audit that is being followed. Now, as I said before, the license review as um, being mentioned in that letter is typically misunderstood by a lot of people, but actually comes down to the fact that there is an audit being started based upon the right that Oracle has in the contract. And the objective of the audit is to determine if there are any compliance issues, which typically results in additional licenses to be sold, but also has the opportunity to see if there are any cross or upsell opportunities. Because think, for example, during an audit from Oracle, Oracle will gather a lot of information with regards to your hardware, what type of hardware you have deployed, what software is being deployed on it, but keep in mind that Oracle sells since a couple of years hardware as well. So it's not uncommon that during an Oracle audit, for example, it has been determined that you have X amount of HP servers running where that information is very valuable for Oracle to include in any business case to see if one of Oracle's engineered systems, Exadata, Exalogic, Exalytics, or any of the other hardware that Oracle sells would be a good opportunity for them to um, offer to you uh, instead of the HP hardware that you currently have in place. 
So be aware of the fact that it's not only being used for compliance purposes, but the information gathered has many, many other objectives as well. Now, the letter has been sent. It has been clear that they want to validate your compliance position, and they will ask you for a single point of contact within your organization. A single point of contact within your organization will be requested to work together with all the people involved internally within the end user to gather the information that is needed. So that single point of contact will need to go to procurement to validate the entitlements. He will need to work with the database administrators to get the database information. He will need to work with business application managers and many, many other individuals within the uh, organization that will need to provide information. And how that is being organized and what different steps will need to be followed during the audit will be discussed in a kickoff call. Now, in that kickoff call or a meeting, uh, one of the things that typically is first going to be discussed is, OK, what products are included in the scope of the audit? Now, in essence, any Oracle product can be included in the scope of an audit. However, as most of you probably know, Oracle has acquired a lot of companies over the last couple of years. And if Oracle would need to include all the Oracle programs that they currently now have in their portfolio, the portfolio is way too big to all the knowledge that you would need to have in order to do that in a proper way. So therefore, during an audit, typically the um, scope of the audit is limited to eight different groups. Because the LMS organization, the audit organization, is really focusing on making sure that those programs are being controlled in the best way and to make sure uh, that they collect any license compliance revenues as a result of that. Uh, of course, those products are being selected, as you see here on the screen, like GD AdWords, Siegel, eBusiness Suite, PeopleSoft, SOA Suite, WebLogic Server, Application Server, and of course, the Oracle database with its options and management packs, because of the fact that the financial risks and the potential exposure that the customers have are the biggest for those products. A lot of data mining and a lot of research has been done over the last couple of years to understand which products should be included in there, and therefore it is typically limited to those eight products. Sometimes it's, it starts with, for example, doing a database audit in a customer, and then the year after, the LMS organization will look at GD AdWords or Siebel or a business suite, depending on what programs, obviously, the customer has uh, within its organization. Now. Once the scope has been discussed, and once it is clear who is the single point of contact during the audit, uh, the LMS organization will typically provide you an overview of all the licenses that they have found are registered for you as an organization. They call that a license inventory um, overview, and that will be created based upon the different legal entities that are part of your organization. So you can imagine that multiple organizations have different legal entities on which they have purchased licenses over the last couple of years. So the auditors will ask you to provide a list of legal entities that are currently part of your organization or entities that did exist in the past so that they can query their internal systems to create an overview, a license inventory overview, reflecting the current licenses that they have registered in that systems. And that includes the different software programs that have been purchased, the order numbers, the order dates, the support star date, the end date, the metrics, the level, like for example, full use, ASFU, embedded, and the status of those licenses. Are they still active? Are they inactive? Have they been terminated, etc.? Now, that information, as I said, is being created based upon the information that is available in the systems of Oracle. But does that really show you what your entitlements are? Well, you probably already guessed. The answer is no. Because if you want to look at the entitlements that uh, a customer has, it should be understood that such an overview is only created out of the uh, internal systems from Oracle. But if you really want to understand what your entitlements are, there are multiple documents that you need to keep in mind in order to really understand what you're entitled to use. Now, what documents do you then need to look at? I just gave you here a graphical picture to explain to you how that works. Now, every order of licenses always starts with an order form. <clears throat> and in that order form, it is listed what specific programs are uh, purchased. For example, two processor licenses, Oracle Database Enterprise Edition. 
And within that order form, there is a reference to a license agreement, an ULSA or an OMA, on top of the order form, in which the, in this case, I used ULSA, because that's still the most common contract that we see, uh, that agreement specifies, for example, the definition of what a processor is. Now, why is that important to understand? It is important to understand because the processor definition from Oracle has changed seven times over the last 10 years. So, depending on the time that you purchase those licenses, the processor definition and the way how you need to count the licenses can be different. Now, apart from the order form which specifies the number and the specific programs of licenses and the ULSA which specifies what should be understood under certain terms and conditions like a processor, with the license you typically also enter into a support contract. And every year you will have a support renewal which gives you the right to make use of Oracle support. What a lot of people actually, however, do not uh, uh, realize themselves is that if you buy a support maintenance contract from Oracle it doesn't only give you the right to make use of technical support from Oracle like for example calling for help if you have an issue in your uh, software or um, uh, putting uh, uh, bug fixes within the software software maintenance from Oracle is actually software updates license and support which means that if you for example bought those licenses in 2000 and one and you have paid support maintenance year over year over year over year you do have the right to make use of the latest version of the software that you purchased so in this example the moment that the licenses were purchased you uh, oracle had 10g the oracle database 10g available as at that moment the latest version of the database but due to the fact that you've been paying support maintenance at the moment that 11G became available, and now it is 12C, you also have the right to make use of those latest versions. Now, why is that important? That is important because in your ULSA and in your order form, it is stated that the program documentation that is related to the licenses that you've purchased is integral part of your agreement which means that all the different features and components that are available and only described in the program documentation of, in this example, 10G, are part of your license agreement. And they do change over years once Oracle comes up with a new version of the software. So certain components and features that were part of Oracle Database 10G may be no longer available in 11G. And next to that, the program documentation, the business practice documentation, like for example Oracle's processor core factor table, which is referred to in the OLSA as a URL, is part of your agreement, or Oracle's application licensing table. Those are all business practice documents that are available online on oracle.com, which are integral part of your agreement and therefore should be kept into mind in order to really understand what your licenses are. So therefore, if you go back to the previous slide where I showed you that you will get an Excel sheet with all the license information that you have, that typically still doesn't specify what you're really entitled to make use of. Because all those documents need to be reviewed before you really understand what your entitlements are. Most common example, uh, just to make it very specific, if you, for example, buy a license for a WebLogic suite, then a lot of people are not aware of the fact that WebLogic Suite includes a lot of products and components, like for example, Coherence, and therefore are not aware of the fact that if they do install Coherence, that they are having the right already to make use of that in their WebLogic Suite licenses. Why are they not aware of that? Because it's only specified in the program documentation and not, and, uh, not somewhere else. So your order form or your all salary or support renewals, which are typically the documents that people uh, read doesn't specify that and therefore it is important to look at all those documents to really understand what you're entitled to make use of. <clears throat> now if we're moving to the next slide, um, so once the audit starts, as said, the entitlements needs to be clear. Then Oracle will start gathering data, data in order to understand what the software uh, 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 usage actually is. And actually, you can define that into five different steps. 
The first step is the hardware discovery, which is actually to get an understanding about the physical hardware on which the software may be deployed. So Oracle will ask you to complete an Excel sheet, which is called the Oracle Server Worksheet, in which you are required to list all the different physical servers and virtual servers, including their specifications like number of CPU, number of cores per CPU, type of CPU, if it's a virtual server or if it's a physical server, the operating system, etc., etc., to compile that list. And next to compiling that list, they will ask you to run certain queries called CPU queries, which are actually a number of commands that need to be executed on operating system level to validate the hardware details that you have declared in the Oracle Server Worksheet. So that is a query, a script, that Oracle wants you to run to validate what you have listed in the OSW to understand if that is complete and accurate. And then the last thing that they will ask you, specifically if you're making use of VMware, which is typically number one compliance issue for customers making use of Oracle, Oracle will ask you to provide you a screenshot of the virtual VMware infrastructure client to understand what VMware version you're running, but even maybe more important to understand what physical servers are being used to host the different virtual VMware servers. Why would Oracle want to have that? Because Oracle, if we're talking about VMware, doesn't recognize that and wants to understand the physical hardware on which the virtual servers are deployed. And that determines the number of licenses that you would need to have. Now, once that hardware information has been obtained, the second step will be is that Oracle would want to understand what software is installed where. Uh, Oracle has multiple ways of doing that. Uh, it's not a, a stage or a phase that always is being followed, uh, but we see it happening more and more. Uh, and the way they uh, will uh, uh, fulfill this step is in two different ways. On one hand, they will provide you an overview of so-called fingerprints, which are actually a list of executables, running processes, where you can configure your own inventory tooling with in order to understand where certain software is installed. So for example, uh, the Oracle database that would want to ask you to run uh, your inventory tooling on oracle.exe, which indicates that there is an Oracle database installed. Now, if you do not have an inventory tool in place, Oracle will provide you a tool called OMT, Oracle Measurement Tool, which can be used to discover Oracle database and um, application server installations within your network based on the TNS ping principle, based upon those ports on which typically Oracle is making use of. Um, of course, this is something that is happening more and more because there are a lot of end users that do not know what software is installed where and therefore uh, will not just be provided manually in an Excel sheet uh, and typically results in a lot of compliance issues because a lot of people are not aware even that certain software is installed on certain servers and therefore required, is required to be licensed. Now, if we have found the hardware, and we found, for example, oracle.exe installed on that server, the next step is, is that the configuration of the software needs to become clear. Because if you, uh, let's use the example of the Oracle database, if you have found a server, you've found oracle.exe through the software inventory on that server, you still don't know if the Oracle database that you found is a standard edition or an enterprise edition. And if it is an enterprise edition, if certain options are installed on that database and if those options are being used. And if those options are being used, if they are being used by system users of the Oracle database itself, or if it is real usage by the end user. So Oracle will provide you, depending on the scope of the uh, audit, different queries, different tools to be run on the software to validate how the software is configured. It will provide you a script called Review Lite that you will need to be uh, running on the different databases to understand the addition, the version, but also the different options and management packs which are installed and or used on that specific database. If the scope includes as well middleware, like the Oracle Application Server or WebLogic, Oracle will ask you to run the Fusion Middleware script to understand what specific middleware components are installed on the different machines in order to determine what specific middleware license is uh, required. If we're talking about Siebel, Oracle will provide you other scripts called the Siebel Extraction scripts, which are being used in order to, 
in order to uh, understand, uh, to, sorry, in order to extract data from the database which is used under the Siebel environment and to extract a number of tables, the data that is used for a Siebel analysis, like for example, the S user table or the S context table, because that information is important for Oracle to understand who is using of what specific Siebel modules. If we're talking about eBusiness Suite, there is an audit trail within the eBusiness Suite itself. And if we're talking about GD AdWords, they will provide you another tool, which is called the Remote Review Tool, in order to collect the information of the GD AdWords installation. So unfortunately, you see that there are multiple different scripts and queries that will be provided to you, depending on the products that are included in the scope. And a lot of end users have asked me, Richard, is there not just one tool or one script that we can use in order to gather all the information for all those Oracle products in once? But I need to disappoint everybody, that tool doesn't exist. And I'm sure that if that tool would ever become available, that person can become very rich, because a lot of people are looking for it. But the reality is, is that it doesn't exist. And honestly, I don't really think it will happen soon that such a tool will become available. Now, once the software configuration is done, the next step is, is that you will need to understand the usage of the software. So let's continue to use the same example. In the hardware, we found the server with, let's say, two processors, single core. We found in the software inventory that Oracle.exe is installed upon it. In the software configuration phase, we found through the review light scripts that it is an Oracle database enterprise edition 11.1 um, with certain options installed like partitioning and certain options used like diagnostic pack and tuning pack. But then still you don't know who is using the software. Now again, for that, for the different uh, programs like database and middleware, Siebel, eBusiness Suite, different methodologies will be followed. For database and middleware, Oracle will ask you to fill in a form, which is called an application record form, which actually describes what specific applications are making use of the specific database and or middleware platforms, and who are the individuals at application level that are making use of the database. For those people that are, are aware of terminologies like multiplexing, Oracle would want to find out what the multiplexing front end is, as included in everybody's contract, to understand what user should be counted. For Siebel, there is a Siebel usage tracking feature in the Siebel software itself, which uh, will need to be enabled in order to understand for a period of four weeks who has been using the Siebel modules and how have they uh, used the software. And for eBusiness Suite, other queries are available as well. And then the last step in the whole data gathering process of an audit is what we call non-system data. And non-system data can be any type of data that is required from a contractual perspective to be gathered, which you can't query through any tool or script. Think, for example, about the specific legal entities that are making use of the software, or if the software is being used for hosting purposes for our specific legal entities, or only for the internal business operations of the end user. Or think about enterprise metrics like total billion of assets or enterprise employees, or the geographical location like Spain, the Netherlands, Germany, where certain servers may only be installed and used. All that information is being guarded in the last phase. And if you summarize that in the last slide of this picture, is that what you see is that for certain parts of the data gathering, tooling and scripts can definitely be helpful. So like hardware discovery, software inventory. But if we're moving up into the layers, like software configuration, usage determination, and non-system data, that is information that can't be gathered technically and will at all times needs to be analyzed manually. Uh, and I think it's important for people to understand that because a lot of people think I buy a tool and I'm done. But unfortunately, that's not the reality. It can definitely help in the data gathering but without having the right knowledge and expertise, you will remain a fool with a tool. And there is a saying which says, a fool with a tool stays a fool. And I think this picture perfectly reflects what we mean with that. Now, we're moving to the next slide. Um, once all the data has been guarded and all the data has been compiled into a report, the LMS organization will provide you a final report where all your entitlements and your deployment and usage of the software is listed in. 
and in which the LMS organization will refer to the compliance policy, which says, as we've seen in the contract, that within 30 days of any incompliancy, you are required to pay for the fees to resolve the issue. Um, next to that, the report will say that you will need to pay back support fees. And back support fees are the fees that Oracle requires you to pay for the usage of software and the support uh, costs that it missed over the last couple of years that you've been using that software. And that is an important thing that we will look into in the next slides. But this is the moment, the moment that you receive the final report, that the uh, lead from LMS is being handed over to the Oracle sales organization. The LMS organization has completed their job. They've done the research, they delivered the final report, and at that moment in time, the sales responsible for your organization will be in charge to do the commercial resolution. Now, for those that are interested in full compliance policy from Oracle, we included the URL in here, which I think is wise to be read by anyone that is being uh, under audit from Oracle to understand where Oracle will come back to with. Now, if we then go to the next slide, I see that my numbers have been uh, mixed up a bit in the slide, but uh, it doesn't matter. I can explain to you how it works. Um, this is just a very practical example why you should care even the cost of one processor license to be out of compliance. Um, if we look at this example, uh, let's think about an end user that has two processor licenses, Oracle Database Enterprise Edition, but is found to make use of three processor licenses, Oracle Database Enterprise Edition, during an audit for a period of six years. Now, in order to calculate for you what the claim from Oracle would be in such a situation is that the list license price for one Oracle Database Enterprise Edition would be $47,500. And the associated support list is $10,450. Now, that is the price that Oracle would charge for you for one processor Oracle Database Enterprise Edition. Now, in any, in any way, even if you're under audit, Oracle at all times, I know it's sometimes being said differently, but at all times allows you a certain standard discount which can either be your contractual discount, like a price hold that you may have, but if not, there is always a standard discount level that Oracle applies for any transaction that it does, even if it's a compliance situation. Now, in this case, for this amount of money, the standard discount is 10%, which means that the net license fee for that one processor is $42,750, and the net support fee is $9,405. But as said in the beginning, during the audits, it may have been discovered that the Oracle database has been used for a period of six years. So Oracle will charge you the support fees that it missed over the last six years, meaning that six years multiplied by 9,405, you will get a back support claim of $56,430. So it is one single processor license that you've been found to be out of compliance for the last six years, sums up to a total fee of $108,000 that you are required to pay within 30 days to Oracle if that is the situation if you have been found non-compliant. So you see that even if it's only one processor license that you're short, it is a lot of money that it is involved. And this is only one processor license. I can tell you I've been working with customers that had hundreds of processor licenses for different programs to be under license, and that's not uncommon. So you do understand that the financial risks that a lot of customers are facing is really big. Now, what can you consider? What tips and tricks can I give you if you are under audits from an Oracle perspective? I think it's a general one, uh, so it's not for every, or not only for Oracle applicable. But let me give you some tips and tricks that you could consider when you are under audits. First and for all, if you are under audit, um, my recommendation is at all times to involve information risk management or security in order to validate what sensitive and or confidential data is requested to be gathered during an audit. And is that something that you can allow to be uh, shared with the end user, with, sorry, with the software vendor? And can it also leave your organization? Can it leave your premises? As a, as a recap, as we've seen in the audit clause, you are required to cooperate with Oracle's request to audit and provide reasonable assistance and access to information. 
it doesn't require you to share any sensitive or confidential data that may be conflicting with data privacy laws that your security department needs to follow because of local regulations. Think, for example, if you do a Siebel measurement, the Siebel scripts that will be provided garners a lot of names from your employees or from your external customers. And do you want to share that kind of data with a vendor like Oracle or any other vendor? Something to consider. Like I said, are you allowed to um, uh, share data uh, and that it can leave your premises, it can leave your offices? Or is it something that you just only want to be, make available for Oracle to inspect at your offices? Again, you're not required to share it outside your organization. You need to provide access and insight to information. But it doesn't say that you need to share that to the vendor. It can also mean that you uh, invite the auditors to inspect that on your own location. The other thing to consider is which results are shared when and with whom from Oracle sales. What we mean with that is that uh, you need to understand is that an audit is a um, uh, gathering of factual information. And that factual information can change when more information is being provided. It's not uncommon that certain preliminary results are being uh, discussed and shared with sales, resulting in the fact that certain expectations from Oracle sales based on those preliminary results are sky high, which can cause issues for you because although it may not be final, certain expectations are being set that you need to manage down. So ask yourself in the whole audit plan and strategy that you follow, is that something that you have uh, covered? And then the last thing in here is what is the performance impact of the Oracle audit tools proposed? Um, like every tool that is being proposed to be run during an audit, it will have a small impact on the performance of your systems. Is that some, something that you can allow? How business critical are your systems that, that you can face that risk? Because be aware of the fact is that Oracle will ask you to run the scripts yourself. And they will say that the performance is very limited, which is true. The performance uh, impact is very limited. But if something is going to go uh, wrong, Oracle will not um, uh, pay for any financial damages that you may have as a result of the fact that the performance of your systems went down. So is that a risk that you can face? Something to ask yourself if you are under audit. And if you are under audit, my overall recommendation at all times is make sure that you do understand before the data is collected, why is it collected? What data is collected? Where is it collected from? And how will this data be used? Because if you are not uh, informed or if the auditors are not able to explain to you why the data is collected for what reason and how it is being done, how can you understand yourself what you share with the vendor? And if, those da if that data is only being used for an audit, it may be fine. But are you sure that the data that is being shared and collected is not being used for any other hardware upsell opportunity because of the fact that the vendor knows what hardware you have deployed. If you want that, then of course you should take the control and say, okay, I release this data as well for you, Oracle, or any other vendor to build a business case upon to give me a proposal for new hardware. But have you controlled that? Typically, that's not the case, and people are confronted with all kinds of proposals where they're actually not waiting for. They just want to fulfill an audit. And then the last thing under audit, things to consider, enforce during an audit that you know what will happen with the data before you share it. So what will Oracle do with the data that is collected? And where will the data be stored? And who can access the data that is collected by Oracle? Reason that you need to be aware of the fact that Oracle is a global organization with different people located in different countries. Can your business sensitive data leave your country? Can it be uh, analyzed by people in other countries like India, Romania? And if so, how do you know for sure that that data is not being used for different purposes? Especially in those days where data privacy is a very hot topic, those things should become clear before you start in the audit and you share data. And 
I believe that it is up to, um, uh, it, or the vendors should inform you upfront about that. But if you don't ask about it, I'm for sure that it won't be told. You won't be told about where it goes. So make sure that you enforce that before you start sharing any data. Now then, some some last tips and tricks, and we're almost at the end of this presentation about okay, what to do to let things run smooth uh, if you're under audit. Uh, the first thing that I believe you should at all times do is do a quick risk assessment. Understand yourself from a contractual perspective and from a usage perspective, where do you face potential risks? And what are the steps that you need to do in order to assess that risk or to quantify how big that risk is? And make sure that from the beginning, you share and manage the expectations towards C-level. If you don't do that, it's not uncommon that a DBA or a lower level IT uh, a part of the organization starts providing and collecting data and then is being confronted with the fact that there are huge financial issues that the C-level organization is not aware of. Therefore, haven't budgeted for it, haven't managed that in a proper way, and may be confronted with a big surprise. That's not something that you want in your organization. So make sure that you share and manage those expectations from the beginning upwards to your C-level organization. And if you are being audited, <coughs> set up an internal governance communication and escalation model. Make sure that you have a dedicated Oracle audit project team with one single point of contact who is managing the project and make sure that different people from different disciplines of your organization like legal, purchasing or vendor management, different IT departments, depending on your organization, they can be multiple IT managers or DBAers or outsourcers, for example, that should all be part of the project team so that they at all times do understand in which step you are of the audit, what needs to happen or what escalations needs to be put in place because of the fact that certain things are not going in the right way. I can tell you from the last 10 years of doing audits is that a lot of things go wrong due to the fact that there is um, uh, uh, misunderstandings, no proper communication and no proper governance in order to manage timelines which results in frustration at your end and at the vendor hand, and therefore do not make sure that the audit will be a smooth experience. And make sure that the Oracle project team is lined up with a steering committee in which different people from C-level or the members of the board are being part so that they are going to get updates on a, let's say, weekly or bi-weekly basis to understand where we are in the whole execution of the audit, what the current findings are, what the issues are, and what support you need. Um, it's not uncommon that certain companies, for example, don't get the data from their outsourcer because of the fact that there are difficulties in the SLA between end user organization and outsourcer. But if you are able to bring that up to C-level, that can put an escalation to the outsourcer or certain parts of the organization, you will make sure that you'll get the support to, re to let the things run smooth. And then the last two uh, recommendations in there is Think about what data is being shared with whom within your company. It's not uncommon that different people on different levels within an organization know too much about the current status or the findings of an audit and that those results are being leaked externally to partners or to Oracle uh, itself and <clears throat> therefore being used against you. Make sure that you do control what data is shared with whom within your company. And last but not least, do your own research, preferably before, but specifically during the audit. Not knowing yourself is being uh, will result in the fact that you will be confronted with surprises that you don't want to have. Now, then the last slides, and then I'm really uh, closing down my part, and then I'm opening up the floor for any uh, further questions or, or Q&A or discussions. Um, what is the best solution to tackle an Oracle audit? I have received that question multiple times. And like I said from the beginning, some people think not cooperating with an audit or um, uh, making sure that you try to hide things is the best solution to tackle an Oracle audit. I honestly don't believe in that. A lot of end users that are um, having issues with audits are typically end users that are reactive. And therefore, my best recommendation is is to become proactive and to take the control yourself and don't wait until you get audited by Oracle. Because don't forget, 
from an Oracle perspective, of course they will audit end users. What else would they do? That's the only right that they have contractually agreed with you to inspect what you're using. And if you're reactive, then you get nasty surprises. If you're proactive and take the control yourself, you can use the facts to make, as I said in the beginning, informed business decisions. So, but how do you become proactive then? Well, the best recommendation in there is to make sure that you perform regular internal license reviews in order to determine your license compliance position, which means that you keep track and manage the entitlements you keep track and determine the deployment and usage of your software. You determine your compliance position. And based upon the gaps that you see from a surplus and a shortage of licenses, you take the appropriate steps to mitigate any financial, operational, and legal risks that you may face. So perform baselines on a regular basis in order to make those unclarities clear and make the right business decisions. So to conclude, some takeaways. Make sure, as a recommendation, that your software license management practices are becoming a priority at sea level, and make sure that you budget for a proper software license management practice, which is tailored to the specific needs of your organization. If you think about it, multiple end users pay thousands or millions of support on a regular basis for all kinds of enterprise software. But ask yourself, how much budget is there available to really proper they manage those licenses. Gartner says it should be 5 to 10% of the support fees you pay on an annual basis, but typically it's way lower than what that is. The other thing, if you don't have it already, make sure that you create an internal software mm -hmm. license management team in which different disciplines of your organization, like procurement, legal, database administrators, infrastructure managers, business application managers, outsourcers, are all participating in and which C-level is giving you uh, sponsorship and ownership to review on a regular basis your real entitlements, and that's not just the Excel sheet that you got from Oracle support or from the Oracle LMS team, but your real entitlements, as we've seen in the beginning, includes your ordering documents, your Oracle license agreements, your support renewals, your support policies, the program documentation, and the business practice documentation, and really understand what that really means. And at the same time, determine your deployment and usage of the software and determine what usage is licensable and what usage is not licensable. And reconcile that on a regular basis in, in order to identify and address any software compliance issues yourself proactively. That's the best solution and the best recommendation that I can give to you. Now, to conclude, um, there is some further reading on our website. Um, as like this expertise session, uh, we uh, believe in the principle that you should share before you gain. So the experience that we um, uh, have and that we build up during our day-to-day -day activities in the software license management area are inspiration for us to write articles and white papers about. I listed a number of uh, articles and white papers here that can be found on our website. Like, for example, the white paper about the answers to your top 20 questions, about an Oracle license review or a license audit. There's an Oracle licensing guide available on our website, an overview about what a ULA is, an unlimited license agreement, and the risks that you should be aware of. Um, what about Oracle pool of funds agreements, Oracle eBusiness Suite? Uh, other uh, articles will be published over the next period of time as well, uh, like Oracle GD AdWords, uh, what are the ins and outs about that, Oracle Siebel, um, but also other software vendors like Adobe, Red Hat, all that kind of stuff we publish on our website uh, because we think and we believe that we should provide that knowledge to end users so that they are aware of it. Obviously, uh, we're happy to uh, receive any suggestions from you about certain topics as inspiration for us to, to, uh, to read about. Um, and and then, like I said, next to this expertise session that we do now in January, we will do this on a regular basis. So every uh, quarter, we will have a theme where we will have in every second month of the quarter a session about a specific topic. So these free expertise sessions will continue to take place going forward. Um, and happy to uh, uh, answer any questions that are maybe right now. So let me just open the floor if there are any questions.